good. Okay, Great. we're all here already. Over to you, Brian. Okay, thanks, Nick. And uh, hello, everyone. And uh, a very warm welcome to this panel on net zero climate data and AI. Oh, my. And I think um, if we were to look back on the history of innovation, what a common pattern we'd see is that the convergence of technology and societal challenges has led to some of the biggest innovation that we've seen uh, over time. And I think we probably all agree that one of the biggest challenges we're facing uh, as a world at the moment is climate change. So the ability to think about and understand how we can use AI and data to better understand that and to make decisions about it, I think is one of the key uh, themes and pressing focus for the community uh, today. <laughs> and so, uh, as I think most of us are doing just now, I asked a large uh, language model for some advice on this panel. I won't name the one because there's many brands out there now. Um, but uh, it came back with a very general answer that didn't really help me much. So I am delighted that we have three experts with us today uh, on the panel to discuss uh, this topic uh, with um, Claire, Lucy and Iona. So a very warm welcome to you. And just as per the other panel sessions in AI Summit, um, if you can, uh, in person, here in the audience, submit your uh, questions online on the app. And for um, everybody that's joining us online, hello, uh, you'd be very welcome to submit your questions as well. And I will um, pass them on to the panel uh, as we go. Um, but for now, um, let's do some introductions. And uh, if you could share your experience of working in this field and what your organisation does um, to set the scene, and then we'll get going with some questions. So uh, over to you first, Claire. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm Claire. I'm the Technical Director of Amanos Analytics, and we're a space data social enterprise uh, that use the space-enabled technologies uh, to highlight and reveal impacts from um, climate change, but also um, large infrastructure developments. Um, I'm sort of here with another hat on because we also work very closely with um, another company, um, EOS Insight, who use AI and um, remote sensing technologies to produce sort of ecology and environmental solutions for land, ma land management. Great. Welcome, Claire. And over to Lucy. Hi there. So, yep, I'm Lucy Donnell and I work as an AI software engineer for Craft Prospect. It's a space engineering company um, based in Glasgow in Govan. Um, we develop enabling technologies um, for small satellites. Um, we use AI to develop autonomous systems that run on board the satellites. So that could be for processing data at the point where it's acquired. And that's really useful for making sure that we get valuable data products um, down to Earth. And that's all for Earth observation, which of course is loads of different applications um, that benefit Earth and the, and the climate. Great, thanks Lucy. And you've got a stand upstairs as well with some great demos that you oh, gave me earlier on. Thanks Give for the, you the plug. plug. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, so um, if you go up to the top floor, um, there's um, th we have a stand where my colleague Charlotte's there just now and I'll be there later today. Um, and we're running a, a simulated pass of our um, wildfire detection application. So you can come and chat to us about that. <coughs> Thanks, Lucy. And Iona. Hi, um, I'm Iona. I'm a senior research scientist uh, working for the National Center for Atmospheric Science. Um, the National Center for Atmospheric Science is one of the UK um, centers, and our focus, as the name says, is on studying the atmosphere. And uh, we are basically starting in our organization to implement AI for uh, tackling climate change as well as mitigation and adaptation. And we work mainly across three main big directions of research, air pollution, uh, long-term global change, and um, high-impact weather. Uh, so um, yeah, we have a, a set of scientists mostly trained in climate and atmosphere. But as I said, we are starting to adapt um, AI technologies for mitigation and adaptation. Fantastic, very well, welcome. So um, I'll maybe start off, there's no questions yet, so please start <coughs> throwing the questions in as well, and uh, I'll ask the panel. But in terms, I guess, thinking about Scotland and the community in Scotland, um, what should we be thinking about in the use of AI into climate um, and uh, the kind of use cases that we can apply there? 
So Claire, you can speak from your experience of, of what you do in your organisation or wider experience of working in the field. Um, so, well, we've just um, wrapped up a project with, uh, with Scottish Enterprise looking at how space data can be used, um, space data and other sort of remote sensing and AI technologies can be used for land management solutions in, in the Highlands. Um, I think because Scotland's got such a, a wealth of natural assets, there's a, real, there's a real potential there to do a lot around um, green recovery and carbon capture to, to reach net zero. Yeah. Great, and Lucy? So, well, for, for Crib Prospect, um, our activities don't, don't specifically target Scotland, um, but what we do is we build these enabling technologies um, where we can capture all this data um, about what's happening on the earth and about, about climate and about, about events. Um, and really, that's quite, an, that's quite an important role. In Scotland, we're really lucky that we have um, quite a lot of, actually, satellite companies. So we have a lot of satellite manufacturing in Glasgow. We also have a lot of data analysis companies. Mm. And a lot of those are in Edinburgh, too. Um, and it's just a really important sort of system that we have. We're moving into launch as well, um, where we can do this sort of end-to-end -end capability. Um, but as I say, our technologies are more enabling, and it's about we're always really interested in all the end uses of the data and how we can best um, su support that. Great. And I, wanna, I guess you've got a global perspective as yes. well. <laughs> you talked about some of those use cases in your introduction. It'd be great to hear a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, so. Um, I will actually start with a more local perspective. So in terms of NCAS as a national centre, we are actually uh, currently developing a collaboration with the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre. And one of the big directions of research is AI for big data. So in Scotland, like the capability for HPC can be combined with our own capability in climate modelling and our large data. So that would be um, one direction which is both local and global. And another thing that um, we think it's very interesting is combining, um, and there was a lot about this in health data with climate data and for understanding better um, the effects of pollution and pollutants on human health. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that would be our like my second uh, point. And then the third, I think, um, in particular in Scotland, but globally, one of the most important things is bringing together together all sorts of data, like the, this discussion is about satellite, but we have satellite data observations uh, as well as climate models, and that is fundamental in tackling climate change. Great. A couple of questions coming in just now, but I'll maybe ask one more, then we'll go into some, some of those. Um, so I guess as we're innovating, we're using data in new areas, we'll encounter barriers that we need to to overcome. So I'd like to ask about maybe some of the barriers you've encountered as you've been doing your work and, and how you've been tackling them. Maybe start with Lucy this time. Anything in particular that's been challenging as you've been developing your technology? Well, I think the biggest challenge um, when you utilise machine learning, um, which is what we do, is the availability of data, um, which I mean, that's not been in use to anyone. Um, so you're always trying to get good data that's um, relevant to your, your use case, it's balanced, um, it's also, it's also labelled because you want it to be sort of accurately labelled um, and you want there to be enough of, enough of that available to develop, you know, like good performing algorithms. Um, the other thing that we do is, because we're deploying machine learning on board satellites, we have a lot of constraints, um, so algorithms have to be able to well, they're quite small in size, um, not only to fit on board a satellite, but so that they actually can run inference really fast. Because um, if they're orbiting the Earth at a certain speed and covering all this all this land, um, it, you want to be able to process that data in real time. So it means that you have to finish off processing by the time you start taking in new data. Um, so all, all these developments in embedded systems and um, hardware is really important. But again, it's, al it's also it's also having data, so we use a lot of optical data, but there's also there's so much potential in um, hyperspectral data and SAR data as well. So it's just getting access to to all this data and ground truth as well. Okay, and I guess working in data that's a perennial thing across any industry is getting the actual right data and yeah. correct and accurate, <laughs> etc. Um, what about yourself, Claire? 
I mean, of course, I'd, I'd second the, the access to data. Yeah. It's always going to be an underlying, um, underlying issue. I think from the barriers that we've faced ourselves, it's been more about sort of engagement and trying to get the impact from the technologies that you're developing and, developing and convincing the users that would actually be able to um, see some impact to believe that these technologies are, are you know, trustworthy yeah. and they're not just too much of a faff to integrate into their existing into their existing solutions. You know, we've worked with um, estates in the mm -hmm. Highlands on understanding what they need for land management solutions and trying to you know, work with them to give them solutions that they can actually use. And I think that's, that's going to be a barrier sort of moving forward as well, sort of understanding how to produce technologies in a way that don't look too technical, I suppose. Yeah. And Iona, for you, biggest barriers? Uh, they, yeah, you, you <laughs> kind of covered everything I wanted to say, but I think, at least in our organization, we are also facing another barrier, which is um, finding the right, right talent and having a new kind of scientist working on this problem, because um, you, we have right now the, capa the capability of AI, maybe in other fields, but we are just starting in climate science. So um, we need joint multidisciplinary teams with AI uh, slash machine learning scientists, as well as the, um, uh, the field knowledge from climate to actually understand physically what is happening. So that is something which we are at least in um, NCAS, but I think in general, uh, we should be very interested in tackling. And it comes down to, again, being open and um, being more ready to work in multidisciplinary teams. Um, and the, the, I think in this sense also having a sort of continuous pipeline from the scientist who works on the data to actually the stakeholder and the metric we are uh, targeting is very important too. Okay, so if we have data scientists, AI engineers in the audience, they don't feel they need to be climate experts, this ability to work with the scientists in that field. Exactly, yeah. it's, uh, yeah, it, it, is really, it is really something very important because me, at least me as a climate scientist, I would spend all the time trying to understand or a machine learning methodology, which an expert already knows very well. But if we come together, we have the capability to tackle the problem much faster. And so. Yeah, great. Okay, there's lots of questions coming in now, so thanks very much. Um, I'll pick one of the first ones that came in uh, from Andrew. Uh, can AI help persuade climate change deniers? So can we use evidence that we're generating from the analysis that we do uh, as, uh, as facts to persuade people who have different opinions. Any thoughts on, on that one, Claire? Uh, I think the short answer is no. Uh, there's, there's so much evidence that having more evidence isn't going, to, isn't going to help. I think it can certainly be used to produce solutions that people can't see. So if, if you're, I'm not, not saying sort of tricking people into doing it properly, but you know, it's, if the technology is, is hidden and society moves as, as a whole, and technology moves as a whole towards um, net zero and tackling the climate crisis, then it, you know, you're bringing those people along anyway. You were nodding along to that as well. Yes, I was just thinking that if people don't believe in climate change yet, there has been a lot of about AI trustworthiness. So if you add another layer of like not like exactly. trusty science <laughs> on that, I think yeah, it will be even bigger. So I, uh, uh, I agree with Claire. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Lucy, do you agree as well? Are we unanimous? Yeah, prob yeah, probably. Although I'd like to think that someone who deny climate change, that might not be the position that they hold all throughout their lives and that there's some, maybe some hope to take on new information and, you know, acknowledge the evidence. But yeah, I, I, I do see the other points, definitely. Okay, thank you. So a question's getting a lot of votes online. Uh, and uh, maybe start with yourself first, Iona, on this one. Um, so AI plays a role in identifying large emissions and rate of receding ice caps, etc. These are all areas where we identify the impacts of climate change. Are there any applications of AI specifically for reducing these impacts? Um, I guess so in terms of data analysis, um, there are lots of methodologies which now make, I mean, we come back to the previous question, can we trust the AI 
more than we trust the models or we trust the model projections. So I guess in terms of quantifying the statistics or giving a rigorous understanding, yes, there are applications like of certain methodologies. Um, I, do not, I do not think that, again, in terms of quantifying a certain change like the ice caps or the measurements or the model projections, are not telling us already what the AI says. And a last answer would be where AI is very useful. So sometimes we don't have enough observations or we don't understand well enough the smaller scales, the very small scales. So that is where the AI can actually give us insight and complement the models and or not having enough data, either specially or back in time enough. But um, I think it's more like complementing what we know or not yeah, I, I absolutely agree, particularly with the small scales. I think that's also probably one of the only ways you can produce an action plan. You know, if you, if you have a perfect forecast of exactly how the ice caps are going to melt, that's not going to help anybody. But if you, if you can project how it will on the small scale, then you can start putting into action some kind of mitigation for that. Okay. Um, I want to start with you, Lucy. I think on satellites, mm -hmm. so um, AI requires data at scale. And I understand that a lot of the climate, land use analysis and global change applications rely on data from small, low-cost cube satellites. Um, should I be concerned by the vast amounts of cube satellites being sent into low orbit? Tomorrow's space junk are essential tools for data gathering. And that's from Alexander. I think, I think, I think all the all the small satellites in space is, is of concern. Um, there are more and more and more and more going in, um, and regulation isn't very mature, or sometimes existent on this. Um, so we are relying on, you know, like organisations, agencies being responsible, um, and there are, are already movements to um, detect and remove uh, space debris. Also, small satellites, um, the smaller ones, it's actually a, a, li a little bit better than the larger ones because what happens is you have them in lower Earth orbit, but they have a, it's like a, it's called a graveyard orbit. We have a plan to start descending um, and then they basically start getting, bur getting burned up by the Earth's atmosphere. Um, so, yeah, it's yes, yes and no. Like, like I would say, well, of course I would say this, um, nanosatellites up in space is an accessible way for us to record important Earth observation data. Um, and they are, they are like a, a, progress, a, a step of progress and they're really useful. But yes, of course, we need to think about things that are st sustainable. That's important too. Yeah. And Iona, what's your opinion on that one? Um, I think we always have to wait the benefits and the progress versus the disadvantages. So I think even the inside satellite data gives us for addressing certain problems with particular focus on climate change. Um, I think there are obvious benefits versus um, disadvantages. And the second thing is, I think given, again, I hope everyone believes in climate change, given the situation with different facets of climate change on Earth, probably worrying about the space, it's like a step forward because there is so much we have to address right now here, especially at local scales, that going and being too worried about a tool which gives us insight into that, it's not maybe the, a priority, or I would see it like that. It's, um, yeah, satellite data is extremely valuable, so. Anyways. Okay. Um. Through one that's rising to the top here, start yourself, clear. Um, can climate data land use analysis be used to increase accountability in decarbonisation, for example, holding carbon offsetting schemes to account? For yes, the I hope so. Um, <laughs> I mean, that's the, the more data you have, the better with things like that. But um, there are schemes. I'm sure lots of people will know there are lots of sort of schemes and incentives for um, carbon capture and monetizing that, but I, I don't know of particularly advanced um, monitoring programs for them. 
And I think that's something that is hopefully going to change very soon. Because, um, yeah, like the, I think the questioner is indicating it. It needs to be followed up. Uh, this needs to be, there needs to be accountability. Yeah. Okay, and Lucy, is that something that you can talk to as well in your experience? Kind of. Well, um, I think it's just going back to this, you know, you have all this evidence, you have all this knowledge, so it's definitely useful, but that's definitely more Claire's area of expertise. Okay. And Iona, are you aware of any carbon accounting type technologies that are in evolution at the moment from...? Um, I wouldn't say one in particular. What, what I could add is the fact that I see the decarbonization problem as a huge optimization problem. And it's like, so in an op optimizing a system problem, there are different factors. So I think we have the data and what my colleague said, but we also have um, the attitude of people and trustworthiness and then the implementation and the metrics. So I think it's a very, very complex problem and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say there is a certain technology or that is the most important. I would say it's a globally a very, very important um, system starting from actual people to the technology, the data and everything else. Okay. Yeah. Um, we've got one in here from uh, Rishir on uh, biodiversity loss. So uh, maybe start with yourself, Lucy, on this one. Um, the tsunami of climate crisis is being closely chased by the mega tsunami of biodiversity loss. How can AI help us tackle these existential threats to humanity and planet? I know some of the software you're working on is alerting, giving various situations that are working on, but any particular thoughts from you on that one? Yes, I mean, with, with AI being applied to climate data, you can, or earth observation data, you can you can really do an awful lot with lots of different applications. So, I mean, with certain types of sensors, you can closely monitor things about about forests, um, about land that you know you wouldn't be able to do with, without these these amazing sensors going right across the electromagnetic spectrum. And also, the AI that actually helps you to get something useful out of all of that you know vast amount of data. Um, there's various applications, but like one thing. Um, the project that I worked on where we developed the fire detection um, solution, there was a downstream element of that. So once we'd done the fire detection, we worked with a company called GSI in Edinburgh and they developed a burned, burned area mapping. Um, so the idea was that afterwards, um, there could be an alert for where there's land that's the recently recovered from uh, an active wildfire, where all the vegetation had been destroyed. Um, and then that way it could be reseeded with the, with the vegetation that really belongs there um, to improve biodiversity. Because what happens is you have all this fertile land after a wildfire and then it can just get, it can just get overrun by some dominant species that doesn't really belong there and you lose all the biodiversity of the area. So there's, there's, there's so many people working on all these different things um, and it's just a really good thing that we have all these different applications of scientists and coming together and using AI for these purposes. Yep, and Claire, anything on biodiversity? Yeah, I, I think, well, we, as I said, we had just finished, um, just wrapping up this project on um, land management solutions and biodiversity and uh, wildlife corridors um, between sort of forestry restoration areas was something that we, we looked at. and. What we focused on was sort of bringing together all existing data because you've got all this like, soil type and like, elevation and wind and so many different factors go into understanding what can be done with land. And I think you bringing AI into that can really can be really powerful in understanding what can live there what, and how to um, produce wildlife corridors that are most beneficial to the, the native um, the ma native biodiversity and and what what combination of, of planting can can really help with biodiversity. Yeah. And I know we've got colleagues in Nature Scott that are looking at a lot of that stuff, mm -hmm. doing projects around Scotland just now in in that area. Um it'd be a comment, I think picking up on some of the stuff that you were mentioning uh, you know, on transparency. This is more of a statement, so I'll try and turn it into a question. Um, 
uh, from Paul. So transparency is critical to every challenge we face uh, on all sides of the equation. Um, what can we do to tear down? Here's a question. Sorry. What can we do to tear down these data silos? No one trusts companies. They won't trust scientists or science either if they are themselves not able to see that data, uh, the data that everyone is using. So I guess you were talking about layering about, we are talking about climate denial, and you put another layer of AI that people question. And ultimately, if you think what I would say, the Daily Mail headline from that could be, you know, whatever it would be, but that's the ultimate test, I would say. Um, how do we work on transparency in this area? Um, I think, uh, so I was reading yesterday actually about the UNESCO initiative, which is called Open Science. Mm -hmm. um, so there is an entire report on that. and. What they are actually suggesting there is um, there are different principles and layers of making our science open and transparent enough, starting with um, an educational component for very young scientists. So building, a, again, a different type of scientist would be open to teamwork and would work in a more, like with more trust and openness up to scientists actually who are doing the science right now. Um, being integrated in the society through outreach activities and um, interacting more with the public. So I think um, that would be one key component. The other component is having more and more available data sources for the public as well as tools such as uh, there is an initiative in Oxford, like you can have this model at home. Uh, so you can do your own climate runs and your own projections. Now. I don't know how many of us would get into the equations and understand everything, but it gives to people some sort of feeling of what is happening because you can install that model on your own computer. And I think it's an extraordinary initiative. So probably through interaction and through making as much of the science as you can available um, to the public, I think. Um. Okay, great. It's probably love to find some of those links from you and share them to the audience when we yeah, sure. later on because I think yeah, that would be yeah. really great. Um, uh, for yourself, Lucy, in terms of transparency, is that something you think about when you're creating your technology? Yes, all the time actually. So um, we follow um, assurance, an assurance appro approach. So when we deploy ML, it's, it's an, an autonomous system. So there's, there's not a person there to sort of monitor mm -hmm. Um, the machine learning as, as it runs, so we, so we need to treat it as, you know, fully autonomous, and we need to make sure that it's trustworthy. So there's lots of different um, different strategies. We use this um, AMLAST approach. So this was like developed by the Assuring Autonomy International program. We fed into their body of knowledge, um, coming from like a sort of space domain um, through research, and assurance in general is just a way to sort of explain how you've developed your machine learning component and how you've tested it and how you've found maybe areas where you might get erroneous behaviour from it and, and what you're doing to respond to that and to show how it's meeting requirements and to what degree. Um, but assurance is like a big topic and what I think is really interesting is the development of explainability as part of assurance. Um, so that's something I'm quite excited about. So explainability is more delving into you know, for an audience, and that, that could be an audience of people who know a lot about AI, or it could be an audience of scientists who know a lot about their domain, but maybe don't know a lot about, about you know, machine learning. Um, and for them to be able to get shown something that gives them a clear, a more clear understanding of the, of the workings, the reasoning of the model. And that could be things like, for image data, what we might use would be like a, like a saliency map, so that we could see visually what features the the machine learning model is considering are most important to classify that image as a, as a, as a certain thing, fire or non fire, or probably not a good example, maybe something with, that's maybe not quite so binary. <laughs> Great. Um, I'm going to pick up a couple of questions, try and merge them together, let's see. Um, and uh, start with yourself, clear on this one if that's okay. Uh, big tech companies work on AI promise uh, net zero carbon offsetting. Uh, this was recently proved to be completely useless against climate change. What are your thoughts on that? How else can we reach net zero if not by carbon offsetting? Oh, I think that there is still some value in carbon offsetting, even if it just incentivizes people to um, really push for green recovery. Um, although I have also read things about, you know, 
carbon offsetting is never going to be as good as never producing the carbon in the first place. Um, and it, there are also risks, I think, of, of certainly big companies and governments using carbon offsetting as a way to say, oh, look, we're doing something. Um, but yeah, I, I, can't, I can't really speak to sort of what else you do apart from just stop producing carbon, and that's a whole other conference. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I'd, or maybe extend that with a, the another question, uh, building on that, uh, Iona. So, uh, a question here from Vishnu: Data centres used to run I, are used to run AI mod models, cryptocurrency, and other tech-related businesses. And journalists are looking into the footprint of these large language models now as well, and asking questions. Um, and there's a huge indirect contributor towards emissions. Uh, is that a problem that's currently being thought about, or again, is that something we need more transparency on? Yes, um, yeah, definitely. There is a lot about um, running, for example, climate model or large data analysis in terms of emissions. So one of the things we could look into, especially for tackling net zero, is actually this sort of um, green software um, engineering or optimizing. So basically, I would say it's optimizing our models and our data analysis tools, including the AI so that we can have the least impact. And that is a problem, especially again in climate. We are just starting to use this and we are not yet optimally using like the right um, software and processors and the, the right distribution, let's say, to, to run a prediction or, and we are working on improving that. So definitely that is, I don't know if it's um, a problem of transparency as much as it is of addressing net zero and minimizing impacts yeah. so okay yeah. thank you uh, a couple of comments just throw in so joe says it sounds like lucy is building skynet maybe that's <laughs> another discussion uh evelyn thank you she says please share the links that you mentioned iona so we'll, we'll get in contact with you and, and do that afterwards um let's pick another one here uh one from callum hi callum so uh, there's a surge in corporate esg reporting uh and wiki rate where represented on a prior panel. Um, what information do you need or would you like from public and private sectors to contribute into the development of this area? Um, start with yourself, Ayana, because you reacted when I asked the question, so you've been thinking about this. So, uh, yeah, if I just to reiterate the question, if I understood well, so what information we would need from the private sector for addressing basically yeah. net zero and climate change? And they have ESG policies in large corporates, so if ideally you were asking them to design something and make some data available, what's the sort of things that you would be interested in? Um, well, I can, I can give an example. So as I mentioned before, if we would go to the um, uh, health industry, we would be very interested. So we currently can't, because of this called so-called trusted environments, we can't really right now access as um, climate scientists or national centers, we can't always access, let's say, the NHS database or to link to impacts of pollution. Mm -hmm. So um, we would need to be able basically to work to have the data. And then if um, another thing that I'm, I can think of is um, there is a lot on us. So when we design measures for mitigation or adaptation, especially for local scales, if we go to local councils, it would be very good to have all sorts of information into how they actually plan to implement those, those measures because there is a gap right now between um, what is implemented, let's say you have climate change, I don't know, in the north of Scotland, and the IPCC or sort of global organizations recommend you do this, 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 but we don't work with those local councils to say, here you need to, I don't know, plant more trees or you'll have more flooding or so, I guess. It depends what you want to tackle in terms of, in, in, in terms of mitigation. Do you want to improve drought? Do you want to improve floods? Are you interested in agriculture. So it's very hard to say what information we need. It's more about tackling the right stakeholder and the right industry for the right problem, but working together. Um, so it does that answer the question? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. And I guess, Lucy, if you had a wish list of <coughs> being able to access data from other organizations to help in the mission of what you're doing, well, I mean, I suppose it's like the use cases are sort of are sort of endless. Like, you do want to have as much satellite data, but you also want as much relevant, like, ground truth you can get your hands on is really useful. Um, 
could you, could, could you can you can match that up if you know something happened um, on a certain date in a certain location. You know you can you can you can pair that up with satellite data that already exists and come up with a data set that you can use for anything. Um, but really, I think the most beneficial thing I think is is the collaboration. Like you were saying, like we a craft prospect we really like to collaborate with um, partners in academia and other in, under other industry um, because it's really important for us to always further develop our knowledge and share our knowledge and we want to come up with solutions for real problems so that part of that is also engaging with end users and finding finding out you know what's important and what can be done yeah and for yourself Claire um, I think well not to repeat what yeah. Iona and Lucy have said, I think information on, I, su I suppose that their plan of what they are going to do with ESG, you know, as long as, you know, understanding that it isn't simply a box ticking um, process for large companies, so, you know, if, if, they, if they have an ESG report, what are they going to do with it? What kind of ground truth do they need? What kind of um, ground, ground truth can they get, get us? Um, how do they want that verified from satellite? Um, so, yeah, the collaboration element is also important. Okay. Uh, thank you. Let's go a bit more uh, technical, and then we'll zoom out again. So a question from Mohammed, um, and uh, we'll start with you, Lucy, if that's okay. How do you make sure that your trained models that are deployed on satellites are safe and would not make any wrong decisions? What kind of testing do you do? Well, so to go back to this um, sort of fire detection example, so <clears throat> we had lots of different um, testing stages. So during the model development, it was very iterative. So you would you would develop, test, develop, and test. But then also, um, so generally when you're you're training with image data, you just have these like tiles. Um, it's really important for us as quickly as possible to start testing with continuous data. Um, because obviously in, in the real world scenario we're looking at these large um, swaths of, of imagery so that's done quite early on um, as well as verifying on the sort of actual region of interest data that's representative of what the model will be deployed on we also would do like very robust verification testing so that's to try and find out like what will cause your model to break so say for the wildfire detection we tested that on like Tokyo. It's never going to be deployed over Tokyo, um, but we, will, we have we have an idea that maybe when there's a lot of sunlight shining off of a lot of glass and metal, maybe that will cause a false detection, and it did. But just having all that information just means that you can go right. Okay, this is expected limitations um, of the model. So it's all about how you you're never going to have a model that's completely perfect. Um, you never really have anything that's completely perfect, but you want to understand um, how your model behaves and also how to use the wider system in the best way to mitigate that and, and, and sort of what, what, what you do in the, the wider system. So that would probably be how we'd go about it. But yeah, th there, will be, there will be a small amount of error. Okay, thanks Lucy. Uh, we've got a couple of minutes left, so maybe finish on two more questions. So this one from Rick. I'll start with you, Iona, on this one. So having worked as an earth scientist in the last century, uh, we knew about some of the challenges we were facing, we could be facing today. How do the panel see the current advances in technology uh, in allowing us to get ahead of these challenges rather than being behind uh, on the back foot, so to speak? So I talked about convergence at the beginning of technologies, etc. How do you see current evolution of technology helping us move forward? I, I think it's, um, so the, at least in the climate science field, the advancement then will be extraordinary because of the AI. Um, a few main directions I could name, and I, I mentioned already the fact that it will help us understand processes or scales which we can't because of the lack of data. And um, another thing is we will be able to um, replace some of our current models which are computationally very expensive with so-called emulators, AI emulators, and that, again, that will be extraordinary in tackling the emissions and because of this climate change. And then I think a third amazing advancement is that the AI gives us the capability to bring together a lot of data 
in a rigorous manner and in an objective rigorous manner. And we didn't have that without the AI. And we have more and more data in our models and we'll produce more data. So I would say these are three main big directions where I see a lot of advance, advancement. Okay, thank you. And for you, um, Lucy? I'm sorry, can you just, I've missed the question a little bit. In terms of, I think the questioner was saying that um, looking at what emerging technologies can help get us ahead of the game on this oh, challenge okay. because they'd foreseen it working in this area 20 odd years ago. Yeah, well, I mean, I, d I, do, I do think that for me the, the assurance and explainability mm. is, has been a big advancement that's really important because I think a lot, a lot of the time actually um, there are so many situations where, where the AI is sitting there as an option um, and it's actually just the, the barriers that are more holding um, things up than, than actually lack of technology. For me, for me, that's the main barrier. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to bring us on a time. We've got two minutes left, so a quick fire question to finish up on. Um, and so you've got a captive audience. Please wrap up. I'm on time. That's good. Um, it says 2.13 on here. We've got two minutes, so let's keep it quick. Um, yeah, I mean, you've got a captive audience of data scientists and practitioners from lots of different industries here and online. How can they get involved? They'll be sitting there thinking, this sounds really interesting. I've got lots of skills. Give me a resource or, or point to something that after this they could go away and have a look and help them to participate. So, uh, Claire, anything from you? I'm not sure about resources or... I mean, this might this is probably a question for my colleagues, but I think something important to drive is an impact plan. Any any technology that anyone is developing needs to have an impact plan. I think there's no, you know, as, as I said before, you can understand perfectly how how badly something can go wrong with the climate, but if there's no if there's no mitigation plan, there's no sort of actionable output to any of it. Okay. So yeah, get, getting involved sort of on the ground, I think, even if it's just partnering with people to do it. Okay, thank you. Lucy? Yeah, well, I mean, I think everyone here is probably quite switched on to the benefits of AI. Um, and I think just um, being open to um, building up a community with each other. Um, I think it's really important, all the relationships that we've forged, I think, I think things like the Scottish AI Alliance and Data Lab, they're all fantastic. And I think there's just so much talent, people doing all the different things. And I think we get a lot of strength in working together whenever we can. Thanks, Lucy. And finally, Anna? Yeah, Lucy already answered, like, I think working together is the key. And then maybe in terms of like a very technical ways, just identifying each of us what valuable data we have and where do we want to go with that and how can we use it together for mitigation and adaptation in particular, so. Okay, yep. thank you. So we brought us in on time, quarter past two. Um, <laughs> bang on time. So can you join me in giving a warm round of applause to our panelists? <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>